This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Michaeline Duclef, who is a uh, reporter for the National Public Radio uh, and also the author of uh, this book, A Hunt, Gather, Parent, What Ancient Cultures Can Teach Us About the Lost Art of Raising Happy, Helpful Little Humans. Welcome, Michaeline. Oh, thank you for having me. So I wanted to ask you just about the premise of this book, because, uh, you know, on the surface, it seems highly un- implausible. Right? I mean, you're, you're a chemist. And if someone said, I'm going to write a book on, uh, you know, let's go to some, you know, uh, ancient cultures, right? primitive cultures, <laughs> and see what they can te- teach us about, you know, chemistry and, and physics and, you know, particle physics. I mean, w- I don't think we would expect mm. to go there and, and find, oh, you know, they've figured out how to build a nuclear power plant, or they've figured out how to, you know, uh, build all these petrochemicals and, and so forth. And so, you know, why mm. would we think that, you know, since we are, in fact, at the epicenter of knowledge and science and so forth, why would we expect mm. to learn anything from these folks? And and then I guess, you know, a secondary question to that is, right, you know, why don't we have, why can't you get, you got a PhD in chemistry, why can't you get a PhD mm-hmm. in, in parenting? I mean, we have all these <laughs> d- departments. I mean, literally, you know, the vast majority of human beings participate in parenting. Very yeah. few people participate in you know, upper management, but every single university has a department on of management, right? Yeah. And yet, you know, yeah. none of them have departments of, of, of parenting, right? There's, you can't get mm. a PhD in this. So, so, you know, I, I guess, I don't know whether the, the, the second question answers the first, I don't know, but why? Kind why of. I mean, I think they're related. It? I think they're related. I think there's two parts. I think first of all, parenting in one, I would argue even parts of psychology, social, social psychology, um, really isn't a science (laughs) you know like parenting like we like to think and the new york times even has a whole section now devoted to science evidence-based parenting Mm -hmm. and the truth of the matter is if you look at the vast majority of that science it's not actually science i mean Mm -hmm. you know they run experiments and they do analyses but like what they actually are concluding isn't really science-based and so if you look back through history the vast majority of our advice on parenting, and I'm not talking about the kind of physiology, like nutrition or vaccines or, you know, but I'm talking about like how you tame a tantrum, how you get a kid to go to bed at night, how how you get them to clean that, help you clean the house. These things, we don't have science to tell us. And in fact, one of the, the uh, psychologists in the book told me, you know, it's easier to put, so, you know, a rocket on Mars than, than it is to like, you know, really do an experiment and social psychology about parenting. Um, and, and so we we th- we think we're all science-based and we think that we do all this parenting through science, but the truth of the matter is it's not. It's through myths and advice that's really old, like hundreds of years old, and through a lot of bad science. Um, yeah. And so why wouldn't you expect to go somewhere and find information about it you know if it was just science-based i can i can kind of see your question of like somebody even told me that once somebody actually told me in san francisco a very liberal person (laughs) that said what are you going to learn from those people who live in the dirt i I, i'm not kidding you this was very early on in my so there is this idea that we can't learn from poor people I, i don't really understand this idea um but the second thing i would say is that we have a lot of problems when it comes to parenting, right? We are stressed out. We raise these kids that are stressed out. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't get our kids to be helpful. We have raised really unhelpful children. Um, We raise children with poor emotional maturity. And so maybe we should start to to wonder, like maybe we should start to wonder where we're getting our advice and maybe we should expand Mm -hmm. that view to, to places and cultures where they don't have those problems or haven't had those problems. Um, in terms of the the departments, this is a very interesting observation, right? That like we put, we value so little parenting. I mean, I think that that's what that says to you, that there's not a department. I mean, this is something that everybody on earth has is a parent at some level, some type of parent and gets parented. 
And yet we don't have institutions devoted to it. And I think that speaks volumes about what we value in our society um, and speaks volumes to how maybe we should look outside our society for, for advice. The last thing I'll say is that I didn't go into this project thinking that, the vi that I would get advice from these communities, which are fully modern communities. Um, but I have to say every piece of advice that I started to get and try in San Francisco, like worked like amazingly mm -hmm. well. And that's really why I wrote the book because it, it was transforming our family and our lives. And I, and I, I wanted other people in, in America to have the opportunity to get that same transformation. Yeah, maybe, maybe the reason why we don't have departments in it is because people never considered you know, parenting to be a, like a real job, right? A real occupation, right? Um, <laughs> well, not know. a paid one, right? I mean, yeah. we're very under, underpaid, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, it, but the, the, the thing is, is like, this is very new, this idea, right? That parenting's not a job. And um, one of the things that really struck me after we returned home, so we traveled to the Yucatan, we traveled to Nunavut, the Arctic Canada, mm -hmm. and Tanzania, and, um, with with the Hadzabe. And when and you say we, you mean you and Rosie, your daughter. Me and Rosie. She was three at the time. She was That's a right. Co anthropologist. <laughs> she was. She's a good anthropologist. Um you know, we got back and one of the things that really struck me was how parenting was respected and valued at the same mm -hmm. level as other tasks, right? There wasn't, it's very genderized in these communities, right? You know, although in the Hadzabi, in the Inuit too, like men did do a lot and, and mm -hmm. one would argue they did more than here. Um, but it's, you know, there's gendered rule, the roles, um, but the roles are valued the same, right? You the, would never say, you know, you're just a parent, right? No one would ever say, you know, that's, yeah, just, uh, yeah just for sure. Mom, right? Yeah. right. Or, or, right, exactly. And, but you could just feel it the way the men interacted with the women and the way they spoke about the job. It was, you could just feel it that there was this respect for the women and their role. Um, and when I came back, actually, I started demanding that respect from my husband and, and from my colleagues. And it really had, I, cause I started to see how there's a lot of, minimization and even your your question like just a job right it's like it's kind of cultivates and perpetuates this idea right and and but that's how that's a that's a new idea in our culture and not that long ago it was just a, just as valued um as as jobs outside outside the home now i, I want to diagnose some of the you know pathologies of modern american parenthood and 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 i, I guess i want to know is do you think if we were to kind of point the finger of blame or causation on this would was it really a, a result of kind of incorrect thinking about how parenting works and maybe we could point the finger at the parenting industry right i mean how do people learn about parenting in these societies no one's buying a parenting book and yet in in our society right you know we get most of our insight into how to be a parent from this this industry right all these books and, and you talk about how this industry got started right where yeah. they were trying to tell orphanages right how to, right, how to right. raise Caretakers. kids right. yeah, yeah. And, and so and i, I it's funny uh, i don't know whether um uh my news feed is reading my reading my brain but i had a uh article from the atlantic that popped up in my news feed just before we started talking and it was from a couple of years ago and it was it had a list of all these books you know like why danish parents are better why right. french parents are better why german <laughs> parents are better and they didn't mention your book because it hadn't been published yet but but you know these books are again not they're not written for the most part by you know experts or phds you know they're they're oftentimes written by you know journalists and and you know, even if they are written by you know PhDs, wh why a lot is of them are written by doctors and PhDs? Yeah, by <laughs> the vast so, majority. Like, but but these you know the Inuit and the Hazda they they don't they don't read parenting books. So is is it a is it a result of kind of the the you know this 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 whole uh, body of thought kind of going off the rails, or is it more due to just the simple? economic and social forces that we're all subject to, like, you know, the suburban living and, and, you know, 
two income households and, you know, all the, the, the mm -hmm. grind of, you know, modern capitalism, right? Well, I think definitely capitalism has some role to play and has amplified it. But I would actually argue that the industry is the result of the trigger, mm -hmm. you know, that we've that we've lost what the Inuit, the Hatzabe, the Maya parents have, and that's our teachers. We've lost the, the people who teach us how to parent. Um, right. Like I, I tell people like, you know, my husband and I spent like a month preparing for the birth of Rosie. Right. We took to these birthing classes and mm -hmm. we didn't take one parenting class. Nobody ever said, like, are you ready to, you know, do you know, you know, it was, it, and, and there's traditionally that is taught through your childhood. Um, you, you watch other families, you watch raising children, you watch your mom, you watch your sister, your aunt raising children, your, your, your grandparents helping so slowly over time the parent teaches the child how to raise raise a child themselves but then also when you have a child you know it's documented in so many places right there's just several people that come and help you and teach you and the reason why we've lost that so that started to go so i'm talking about the extended family right we this idea of a nuclear family is incredibly new right it really is about 100 150 years old um, in newer and poorer economic households mm -hmm. and still exist in a lot of families in America, right? But about 100, 150 years ago, we started losing the extended family. We started living in these boxes with two people and dog and, and kids. And what that did was that meant that people started having babies and not having any knowledge of how what to do with them. You know, we didn't see it. Um, and this process actually began like 500, 600 years ago. And in the book I talk about, there's research out of Harvard and the University of British Columbia, which makes the argument that the Catholic Church was the one that actually started this whole process by preventing certain marriages and breaking up kind of big clans and big extended families. And there's this analysis that looks at, that was published in Science a few years ago, that looks at like how long the Catholic Church has been influencing a community or society or country in like the extent to the formation of the, the existence of the nuclear family or the destruction of the extended family. And you can see it pretty profoundly, right? That Europe has been under the influence a long time. And so the nuclear family has become really the norm there. Mm -hmm. um, and other parts are like slowly becoming more nuclear family oriented. And in these papers, they argue that this this destruction of the extended family is what led to the the um, arise, arrival, arising of kind of the Western psychology, which is like individualism, consumerism, right? And all these things that Western psychology does, it's really, the psyche does, it's really weird, right? And you can, you can imagine, right? If you've lost your extended family and you've gone from living with five to 10 people in, in, a, in a home or in a neighborhood to living by yourself with your husband or your wife, how that would affect your parenting, mm -hmm. right? And in what the women and the men had in the, in the Yucatan, in the Arctic, in the Hadzabe, oh my gosh, the Hadzabe women had it in spades was this group of people that helped them parent mm -hmm. right the hasabi women we, we were in this camp with like they live in these camps these beautiful little huts that they build and there's about 30 people and they live together and it's not necessarily um ken at all and they move around they're not permanent and they can go to a different camp i think they get in fights and they you know they go to different camps and stuff but they have about 30 people it's about five or six women that are really raising their children together you know, and there's there's one woman in the book who had a dis, a child with a disability, and all those women, eight nine hours a day were working together to raise those children, and that's how you learn to parent, right? Yeah. And that's what we've lost, and and it, well, and, and it happened like like I said, like it started happening like a couple hundred years ago, and that's when these books arose, right? So if you look back at the history, yes, parenting books arose for doctors and nurses that were taking care of orphans in these large foundling hospitals and orphanages. But if you look at the history of it, they actually found this audience in the, the middle class, upper middle class mom and dad who didn't were, were, were losing their teachers and they were hungry for this knowledge. And so slowly we, we started learning through these books. And I think that's what created this, this industry, you know, of I'm gonna tell you how to do it 
in this, mm -hmm. you know, in these 200 pages. And now it's, I'm going to tell you how to do it on this YouTube video. Right. <laughs> so, Right. Yeah. I mean, I think part, certainly part of the story, right. The destruction of the, um, extended family and, you know, you no longer have multi-generational, multi-generational households. You no longer have people living with their cousins and second cousins and so forth. But it seems like, you know, you don't necessarily need that. You could have allo parenting through, through, through friends, right. And through, sure. through neighbors. And, and it seems sure, like, sure. I mean, and certainly when, when I was growing up in, in the 1970s, uh, we didn't have extended family, but at least the, the neighborhood seemed a little bit closer to what you describe and uh, you know in just suburban america where the, the kids would roam around and you know hop around households and if you found yourself in someone else's household you'd eat dinner with them and right and and it, it seems like so the, the nuclear family it's it's not simply that you don't have relatives around but it seems like people tend to stick to themselves um and they're not really as as community oriented for sure um, you know and, and i think you get into this idea of like privacy, the rise of privacy, right? And that like mm -hmm. some people describe it as like, you know, that homes used to be these, and if we're, where we were, every place we traveled, homes were these porous structures, what you're describing, right? Like you, kids could go, go in and out of different homes and, yeah. and you know, you could spend it like in the Arctic, I remember like kids would just come over and spend the night. And I, I don't think the parents knew. I mean, it was just, everybody was taking care of everybody, right? And it was this very fluid, porous home right and and what has happened is we've become very very kind of in love with privacy and the home has become this very kind of castle-y thing where you know you we don't want to intrude right i mean you can even look at like the number of rooms right and see how we're obsessed with privacy <laughs> we really we really are in like individual rooms and individual space and and i think yeah, that's the trajectory, right? It started off like family, neighbor, and it moved to more like a neighborhood. Maybe you've you, you've you've left your your parents' town, but you still created this like neighborhood. And and then now the the extreme really is like you go to American towns, like even small towns, and there's no kids playing outside, mm -hmm. right? And um, that has a lot of repercussions on its own. But you're exactly right. It's just become more and more this way, and we absolutely have allo parents right we have friends and nannies and teachers and coaches it's just our society has also over the last hundred years like really devalued them you know like there was a pew, pew research done not that long ago that you know people say like the ideal version of a family is like a mom staying at home with the kid right whereas one could really argue evolutionarily and psychologically that the ideal family is actually you know five adults living in like you know mm -hmm. a multi-unit house right and and taking care of all the kids kids together i mean that that's where i think parents would thrive and children would would thrive but we've moved we've moved so 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 away from that but you can bring it back pretty easily mm -hmm. you know you can't you don't like i say you don't need a village people always say you need a village no you really don't you need like two other adults that are helping right and that really care and you work together and you can find that because people are hungry for it. Yeah. You know? Well, you talk a bit about how, you know, you would spend so much time with Rosie that you guys would kind of get sick of each other oh my God. after a while. For sure. Right. And, <laughs> and so, you know, one thing that I found puzzling is that it seems as if more parents spend more time now engaging in what they call child, you know, rearing than they did in, in the past, um, which is kind of strange because, you know, people have, they're far more dual income households and, and, and so much other stuff going on. Uh, and, and so one would think like, oh, if I, if I spend more time with my child, then I m must be doing, you know, more parenting and therefore I'm going to get kind of, kind of better results. Right. I mean, so, that's the thinking, so, right? The more you do yeah. and the more you say for sure, the better you, but, but I mean, that speaks again to this lack of valuing allo parenting, right? That mm -hmm. the best results are when you spend time with the children which is very strange. Nobody, mm -hmm. I mean, in other parts of the world, you just don't find this thinking. Like I talk about in the book, like we were in the Arctic like two days in this little tiny fishing village. And you know, the first couple of days we didn't know many people. And I was actually trying to find a place to stay. And this woman like ran out of her house and she was like, you've been with this child, like only you by yourself for like two days and this is abnormal and something's wrong. And like, you can't do this by yourself. And she would like literally wanted to take Rosie and give me a break, 
you know, and then one of the moms said to me, like, you know, you spend you spend too much time with her. Like she she misbehaves because she's tired of you. Right. So there's a totally different way of thinking. And there's a different assumption there. Your our assumption is the more the parent spends time with the kid, the better the outcome. Right. That is like a pervasive thinking. Whereas like if you look throughout human history, I would argue. And if you look around the world, that's not the, the pervasive thinking. The pervasive mm -hmm. thinking is children need to be around other children, you know, multi-age groups. Children need to be around older people. And children need to, to separate from their, their parents very early on. And that this is what makes a healthy parent and a healthy child. And not, there's a lot of like evidence to back this up. It's probably one of the, the strongest theories on parenting out there is that, you know, this is really where children thrive is when they're, and there's some studies that look at this, like how much time the parent kids spend in hunter gatherer groups and it, around like two, it starts to decline to like 20, less than 20, 20% or something. So it's very early on, the kids start, you know, really not spending time with, with their, their mom and dad. Um, but on the other hand, you know, even though we're spending more time with our kids, we're, we're spending time on what you would call kind of child centric activities Huge rather, than, rather than using that time together to kind of, you know, focus on adult centric activities. Maybe now would be a good time for you. I think you categorize the two main approaches to parenting that are dominant in the Western world as, you know, helicopter parenting. And, and then there's this, you know, free range parenting, which is sort of. A, a pushback against the, mm -hmm. the helicopter parenting. The swing. So maybe, maybe, yeah. So maybe start. Well, start. And at first, when I was reading this, I was like, "Oh, yeah, we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read about free range parenting." And and you distinguish between this and that. But but maybe we'll start with the helicopter parenting. You point out that there's a much higher there's there are high levels of anxiety right among young people, and I think this is not simply due to COVID. This preceded COVID. Yeah. Very high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, and and of course the parents also right high right. levels of uh, anxiety and depression, postpartum depression, and and certainly anxiety around parenting, and and I think what you're you're you're, you're offering is sort of you know you're you're pointing out that it's it's a lose lose right that the parental anxiety is in many ways sort of leading to the the child ang anxiety the, yeah. the parental um, obsession over you know engineering the the child's life and providing continual direction mm -hmm. and exhortations is. Is, is bad for them and, and it's bad for the parents. Yeah, for sure. I think it's like a combination of engineering and, and like optimizing the child's life, mm -hmm. right? And again, I think it comes from a really good place. Like you say, we want the best and we want to do the best. But I also think there's a lot, uh, the, the anthropologist David Lancey calls it the shrink wrapping of the child. <laughs> She's a little bit like negative, but like there's a lot of fear around a child physically and COVID has exacerbated mm -hmm. this, but it was before right that if you look at kids like this idea that you talked about in the 70s that's like me like i roam the neighborhood i roam streams and forests and this is rare because parents are really afraid right mm -hmm. and a lot of the direction and a lot of the control is this this fear that's been kind of put in, into us so i think there's two things that cause the anxiety and the helicoptering um, and it's interesting because a lot of parents tell me, oh, I don't helicopter and I give my child a lot of autonomy. And the truth of the matter is, I thought I was like that, but the truth of the matter is it, it, it is very rare in the United States. And when you actually see it, like what it looks like for a child to have autonomy and for the parent to actually step back and not free range, but like, uh, like you said, like step back and observe and be there and support, but, but, but let the child have autonomy and give the child autonomy. It's very different than what you see in the US. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, when I started doing it, and I describe how you, it's pretty easy to do, at least to try. It's hard to maintain if you're used to it, but to start mm -hmm. trying, once I started doing that, my relationship with Rosie improved enormously because we weren't arguing so much and we weren't in conflict so much. And that's really the root cause of anxiety in the US is this kind of constant nagging and telling the child what to do and on top of the child and and children know it they know they mm -hmm. they need it like multiple children yeah. tell me it and parents tell me that children tell them but it's like we don't know how to do it really i think yeah well you know it's funny because uh, I've, I've talked to some people about education and they and they say oh yeah you know the educational system which is built on you know rigidity and obedience and structure mm -hmm. well that was, that was functional right it helped to create these you know factory workers that just did their thing 
But, you know, it doesn't seem like the type of parenting that you're describing is really functional, right? It doesn't seem to create adults that are, you know, capable of, of, of thriving. I mean, I, I spend most <laughs> of my time with... What are I mean, you talking about? The what we saw are, are um, kids that are like incredibly functional, like highly, highly functional. No, no, I'm talking about the parents, the, the way we raise kids oh, here in America. Oh, I thought you meant in the yeah. book. I was like, no, 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 no. exactly. We no, but, don't but, raise but, functional but, but, children. But it's, it seems like, you know, we say we want to have autonomous, you know, self-directed yeah, people independent. with good, you know, self-emotional management. Like this is what we all talk about. Like this is what we want. And hmm. that's what we're trying to produce. And we're doing, and, and yet it seems like the Mayan kids would be, you know, better prepared to, you know, thrive in, in American society even than, you know, the American kids. Oh, absolutely. I mean, all the children that that we were with, you know, have just enormous amount enormous amounts of executive function, right? Because mm -hmm. they've been you know, I say if if you if children are just in child centered acti activities, so activities that are made just for children, Mm -hmm. How will they ever learn to behave in, in an adult setting, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the anthropologists, Susan Gaskins, told me like it's it's actually like a very like dep a deprivation for the child, right? A child whose nights are filled with activities made just for children and whose weekends are filled with parties, birthday parties, zoos, you know, um, art classes, you know, just constant instruction and is is in this this world that's really not rich. Right? And 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 she said, you know, children that live in the adult world have a, you know, it's a much richer environment. It's almost like the difference between like a rat or a mouse that's living in the in like a curated laboratory environment, mm -hmm. you know, where you stick a couple like fake plants in the cage to give them like stimulation. I mean, that's almost yeah. what like the kitty environment is compared to like, you know, a kid who on the weekend is out with his dad building a house, you know? Well, do you think it's because the parents, they think their own lives suck and they don't want the kid to kind of keep the kids as far, you know, to keep to keep them from, you know, like we're going to, we're going to preserve you from this horrible oh. adult life for as long as possible. You know, I mean, for sure. You can see in the psychological literature that around the late 1800s, there was this kind of turn. And I mean, some of it is like in response to ch factory workers, right. That like yeah. children were being put into working conditions that, that were unsafe and, you know, in, yeah. in the adult world, the adult world changed very quickly at that time, right? In the Industrial Revolution. And so they're, you know, putting kids into that environment was not good, right? Um, so for sure, around that time, there was this very, very clear change in psychology that said, you know, a child's job is to play. Yeah. Right. And up until that point, for one could argue, you know, 100,000 years or, you know, how, however we've been on this, this planet, you know, People, parents have thought that a child's job was to play. Absolutely. All the kids play in these places, yeah. but it's also to contribute to the family and start learning how to contribute. Right. And that there's, th that's what we've lost is this yeah. thinking. Well, we have this idea that child labor is, is like exploitation. And right. I suppose, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, renting them out to a oriental rug factory, <laughs> that's one thing. But if right. you're, if you're, you know, having them help you cook, that's, that's a, that's something different. Right. I, mean, I certainly grew up in my, my household, the number of, I mean, I had to do everything. I had to clean the gutters, you know, rake the leaves, all that kind of stuff. And, and you talk about this, a uh, comedito, this concept, which I, I, re I really love this. Oh my gosh, um, it's so beautiful, this, isn't it? And, and yeah. And so, um, so, uh, you know, how do you, how do you create this, right? I mean, one, I remember, and when I read it, I was thinking of this movie that came out a couple of years back. It was called Baby, and I don't know if you remember this movie. Oh, and they went I've, to like three... I've watched it a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, and and the thing and the thing I remembered was in, and I don't know whether it was was it was it Khoisan or Hadza or if they had they're the Khoisan, one... yeah, in in Namibia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think the key lesson there was that you have to let the kids fail, right? if you want them to succeed. And you know, what we do is like, we're always in such a hurry. Mm. If we're cooking, kid comes over and starts making a mess. You're just like, get out of here. Right? right. And they're just like, no, no, let the kid mess up. And that's how they, that's how they learn. And, and I'm wondering why, you know, we have this whole fail fast, you know, you live in San Francisco and you know, I live in the Bay area. We're all about like failure, failure, failure. But then when it comes to our kids, it's like, we, we don't, we don't want them to kind of 
fail in that way? Uh, is that just because we're, we're, we're too busy? I mean, I, I interviewed Dan Willingham, uh, one of my earliest podcasts, and he said, the way to teach kids to read is to start with the assumption that, you know, they're not going to read like adults. Mm -hmm. You know, beginners have to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so, y you know, wh why is it that we don't let them kind of, mm -hmm. you know, learn through trial and error? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Like, I think in like every culture that I've interacted with besides the West, you know, parents really think that learning to be helpful, learning to clean the house, cook, you know, be a family member, a contributing family member is a skill that takes time to learn, just like we teach children to learn to read and write. And yet we kind of think that kids just know it. And so why do they need to help? Why do they need to, you know, why do they need to practice, right? Because there's this sense that they know it, that we're going to put a chore chart on the, the wall and they're going to know what to do. You know, I even remember like telling Rosie when she was like two, like load the dishwasher. You know, there's like this sense that somehow maybe it's the devaluing of the work, but it's like this sense that they don't need to practice. Right. So why would you let them interfere with what you're doing? Um, you know, slow you down, make more of a mess if you think they're kind of they don't need to practice at it. Right. So I think one of the things is like shifting that view of like, Look, if you want a kid to be helpful, know how to, you know, clean up, know how to cook, know how to take care of younger children, you know, young, your younger children, they need practice at it, right? Yeah. And the way they get practice at it is just like you said, like trying, you know? Um, I mean, this is a very, very clear, crazy thing that we do and very clear distinction between basically Western society and almost every other culture in the world is that when kids are younger, we tell them not to help, right? We shoo them away. This has been documented over and over again. Just like you said, we said, go play, right? And what happens is over time, the kid's not stupid. And the kid thinks like, okay, well, it's not my job in the household to clean or help. My job is to go play. My job is to go watch TV. And then when they're 10 or 11, we're like, why aren't you helping? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but I think it comes from this idea that one, like, children's role in the house is to play, right? And children aren't supposed to work, even though there's a lot of in-between between never doing anything and working in a factory, right? <laughs> and one could also argue that for children's own psychological benefit, learning to help and contribute in the household is huge, right? Because you're not, the kids are not just learning to cook or clean, they're also learning to cooperate, right? Yeah. With you. Right. And work as a team. I mean, Ocomodito and a lot of what we talk about in the book is about working as a team. And this is a team effort. Right. And we tend to emphasize independence, doing things on our own. But um, so the, that method of like shooing away is definitely one of the key things that leads to these very unhelpful kids that has also been very documented and something we struggle with. Um, and I, And I have to say, People say this, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time to let them help. And it's the thing is, is yeah. they don't have to help at every meal or like, you know, everything. And the help can be tiny, tiny. It can be like yeah. most of the time the kids would like, you know, come in and make one tortilla and leave. Right. You know, or the or the little girl in the pods that, you know, would carry one little bucket of water or one little thing. Right. It's these tiny or tiny. Go grab the bowl. Go grab your little sister. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's these tiny, tiny little things. So one is just tiny, give them a tiny task. And number two, like, like value that learning as much as like Mandarin on Saturdays or the violin on Saturdays, you know, set aside an hour a week where you're like, we're going to make a meal together as a family. We're going to spend the time outside, you know, cleaning up the yard. Or we have like on the weekends, like mm -hmm. two hour cleaning fests where we all clean, you know, and it, and what that does is it's like, it values that work. And I, and I tell Rosie, like, do you want to have clean clothes? Do you want to live in a pigsty? You know, like you acknowledge the value of that work, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be all the time. It just has to be a, l a little bit. And when they do come over to help, just just let them a little bit. Most of them will leave after like a minute or two. And just by not shooing them off, you're telling them that yes, this is this is this is part of their job as a as a fan as a family member. You know, I'll tell you an interesting story. I was talking to. Belinda Campos at UC Irvine. She's a psychologist and she t she's mix from Mexican American family. And she said she watched the Brady Bunch when she was little and she found that they got allowances for doing chores. And she mm -hmm. told her mom, she's like, you know, these white kids get allowances. Like, you know, yeah. I want an allowance. And her mom 
said, yeah, you know, this is a team effort. Like you live here, you eat here. Mm -hmm. You know, she hasn't read my book, but she's like, you live here, you, you eat, you eat here. You know, we, we work on these tasks together. And then her mom said, in fact, if you don't start doing it, I'm going to start charging you yeah. <laughs> room and board. <laughs> uh -huh. And I just love that yeah. because that's the difference in the thinking, right? We think they should be rewarded when they help. Where is yeah. that the Mexican American view or Belinda's mom is that the kid should be helping because they get the award, the reward of living there. They get the benefit of living there. Right. Very different view. Well, I mean, this, yeah, I mean, this speaks to intrinsic motivation. And, you know, I think what you, well, going back to learning, there's a whole nother section in the, in the Inuit section where you talk about how, you know, kids have to learn executive function, right? You have to learn emotional management. This does, you know, you don't come out of the womb with these Same skills. Thing, yeah. So you have to let them, let them fail at it. And, and, you know, don't get angry if they're failing right. at it. Cause, but, but I think the reason why we do is because I, I think there's a, there's a, a view of human nature mm. that we have in, in the West, which is that kids are these Machiavellian, mm -hmm. um, you know, totally rational, uh, little scheming ad adults yes, that exactly. are just trying to figure out like, how can I, how can I get what I want? And, 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 you know, there's evidence that they're, exploring they're trying to understand the social world and so forth but why would we think that they are just like energy can they want to be the you know they want to rule the roost and yeah and manipulate uh, and, right and, you know, Manip bosses yeah. around and yeah i know my sister told me when rosie was six months old that she was already manipulating me <laughs> uh -huh. and people will say this that babies are manipulative and I'm like, no you know, there's no data that toddlers are manipulative right or even four or five year olds i think as they get older there's probably more data on it or there 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 should be um but yes this view really um shoots us in the foot i think right because we come at them as if they're they have all this malfeasance right and all these kind of mm -hmm. nefarious motivations and of course that makes us angry, right? And that makes us come back very defensively in a very conflictual way, right? And whereas the Inuit elders would tell me like, she's not pushing your buttons. She's not manipulating. Like one woman actually laughed at me. She was like, of course she's not pushing it. She's not manipulating you. She's three, like she's just doesn't know how to behave, right? And can't handle whatever situation she's in. And, and so, you know, explodes and screams and yells because that's what babies do. And so that's what toddlers end up doing. Um, and, and they would tell me like, you know, there are these irrational, illogical creatures and it's your job to like slowly over time, just like teaching them to read and write, show them logic and teach them logic mm -hmm. and show them mature behavior. And so if you yell or get angry at a child in, in an Inuit community, you're just thought of as a child, you know, you're just, it's a very mm -hmm. immature behavior, right? And so the parents will just sit there like the kids like totally freaking out and the parent doesn't leave and doesn't ignore them isn't like angry isn't upset just sits there or they're like bring them over to the window and show them the outside there's a lot of like creating awe in the child and um i remember in the in the hot a little boy was having a total tantrum and the mom didn't leave she just stood there and like took her hand out and like put it like near his level and just stood there and, you know, created this very calm anchoring presence for the little boy. And after like 20 seconds, which is pretty long for tantrum, you know, put, put, put his head on her leg and it, and it was just done, you know, mm -hmm. and very few words. We have this like highly verbal approach to parenting. Well, to everything. Like if you read psychology, right, that talking about it will fix everything. Right. <laughs> and like, very this is one of the first things I learned when we went to the Yucatan was I was like trying to figure out how to get Rosie to behave on the plane because I knew we had like a massive trip to Tanzania and I was like how do I get her to behave on the plane and I realized like on the way back from the Yucatan I was like I just need to shut up <laughs> like if I just stay calm and be quiet and kind of ignore her like not completely but like not talk to her she just kind of entertains herself well, this this gets back to the kind of model, acknowledge, and and practice um, the formula. template that you, yes. you offer up. Yeah, it's the formula, and but but and you've also got the team. We'll have to you know tell us what those all stand for. But but um, but I wanted you to distinguish this from positive parenting, mm. right? So you know the positive parenting folks say, you know, don't yell, don't scream, don't chastise, 
Instead, you should, you know, praise, praise, praise and say, you know, oh, you know, that's, you, you did such a great job, you know, putting that dish away. And, and you're saying, no, 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 like that's also an, an appeal to extrinsic motivation mm. in a way, mm -hmm. right? So, so how, how do the, how do the, this, how is the positive just kind of the flip side of the, the, the negative. You know, it's interesting because I think there's elements of the positive parenting that you find in other places, right? This like no yelling kind of calmer approach, mm -hmm. but I think it gets a little overboard. And I think there's, there's too much ignoring of the bad, right? I mean, like if you look mm -hmm. at um, anthropologists, there's a handful of anthropologists who study American parenting. So they study American families like through an anthropological lens. And there's, it's so mm -hmm. fascinating work. And one of them is Peggy Miller, and she has a book about praise. Um, and her her research has shown they followed like four or five families in, I think, in Ohio for like a long time. And what she found, and I think this is my problem with positive parenting, is that the, the families ignored like half of the child's life, the negative life, the negative side, right? It's just ignored. And so there's this kind of very disingenuine um approach right and and this you don't find like parents are just straightforward with kids it's like look this is lazy or you know like this is unhelpful you're being unhelpful you know there's they just say kind of what's wrong okay that was helpful this is like the acknowledging part of the formula right just acknowledging what the child is doing whether it's good or bad right and and i think the positive parenting is missing that side of it and that I, that is important for children it's important for adults right because children are trying to figure out like what is important for my family, right? What's important for my society? And if, if you're not giving them the negative parts of it, you're, they're missing half of the puzzle, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's one thing that's missing. The praise thing is a hot mess. I mean, okay, look, I always say like, if you can't find it in any other culture in the world, you gotta start being suspicious of it because like, we didn't like invent better parenting. That is for sure. You can just spend like two days with the Maya parents and you'll see that we are not good parents in many ways. So, you know, you just don't find praise like that. And especially like kind of disingenuous praise. It's like kind of overboard and children don't need it. And there's no data to support that it, it always works. The data are all over the map, right? Like, you know, sometimes it helps motivation. Sometimes it doesn't. It definitely um, encourages competition between siblings. And um, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it's just not necessary and it's exhausting for me. Um, the other thing about positive parenting that kind of irks me is like this idea that you're telling the child what to feel. I don't know if you've heard of this, like mm -hmm. this idea of like the child's upset and you say, you're angry and I see that I see that you're angry and like your emotional coaching, I think is what they call it, right? Again, you don't find this anywhere. And in some ways, I think it's very controlling of the child, right? Because you're kind of telling them how to feel, you know? And, and in a lot of cases, maybe they shouldn't need to be angry, right? Like, the, like, you know, like they have to share their water with their, like, I remember when we flew back to Canada, we were in the airport and, you know, there was a, a, a white family there and we had just gotten back and the kid was crying and screaming like a seven-year-old, which I hadn't heard a kid over three screaming the whole time we were in the Arctic, like the, the toddler scream and that's it. Um, and they were screaming because he had like share his water. And the mom was like, oh, you're so angry because you have to share the water. And there was just this like, and it was like, okay, number one, the child's acting like a complete selfish person. And like, you're telling him it's okay in some way by telling him you're so angry, you know, and whereas a lot of parents would say you're being selfish and then ignore the child and ignore the outburst. Right. So very mm -hmm. different, very different approach to, you, you know, you're, oh, you're so angry. I can mm -hmm. see you're so angry. And then she said to the kid, like, do you want some potato chips? And I was like, wow, the kid is like not caring for his family. You're telling him it's OK and he can be angry about it. And then you're actually asking him if he wants something. Right. It's just. I, I'm sorry. It just like blew my mind because it's just so <laughs> different than like how a child would be treated in Western society like 50 years ago, right? And treated anywhere yeah. else in the well, world. <laughs> you, talk, you talk about these two levels, right? You talk about micro and, and macro. And, and so the micro parenting is the sort of in, in the moment kind of yeah. ways in which you issue commands or uh, praise or whatever. But then there's also this idea of the macro parenting, which is presenting your 
child with an environment. You know, the schedule, me a lot of, right? Um, the schedule, like the overarching yeah. day, like what is the child doing, right? Or even what's in their environment, yeah. right? So, so you know, the micro would be like, don't don't play with that iPad, and the macro is like, well, why is there an iPad, you know, in the room? Exactly. Right? So, um, <laughs> and it reminded me of you know, Emil. I think Emil is the first parenting book of you know our time, right, by Rousseau, and and you know, he says you got to engineer the, mm. the environment, right, behind the scenes right. to create a, a place where where kids can can thrive and and learn. Interesting. Yeah, it's like if you're having a conflict over the iPad, like the Inuit parents would be like, don't have the iPad, <laughs> right? Like one of the moms told me, she said like, we never, we would never let like an object create conflict. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I let objects create conflict like yeah. every moment of my life. But yeah, you're right. Well, to some, Engineering to the environment can make your life well, easier. But to some extent, the macro environment is beyond the control of the parent, right? I mean, you know, so much of what kids learn comes from the other kids, right? And and I remember in the in the last chapter, I think you were you were talking about, um, uh, you know, lateral learning and how how you know kids have to be around other kids and kids they're older kids and younger kids and so forth. And, and I I went to Montessori mm. school and they had um, we had first, second, and third grade all in the same yeah. classroom, and so we were all kind of teaching each other and 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 helping each other out and that sort of thing. You know, it's it's tough if you if you to be I mean, if, if you live in a neighborhood and you're like, oh, I'm gonna let my kids play out in the, in the yard and there's no other kids, right. it's, it's tough, right? right? So if, if you're trying to raise your kids one way and all the other parents are raising them a, a, a different way, does, does that create some, some tension? I mean, does that make it, make it harder? Do you have to kind of find like-minded parents or yeah. a neighborhood? Are there, are there gonna be these neighborhoods where people are gonna go? I mean, I know, I know this from the free range parent movement. They're like, oh, let's go, you know, go to Berkeley where all, <laughs> you know, there's some free, free range parents and so forth. Oh my gosh. I wish, I wish there were free range parents in Berkeley. Um, you know, I think, I think it is hard. You would think I know, that you would be there. You'd but think I don't that's think it's true anymore. <laughs> um, right. um, you know, I think it is harder. There's no doubt. I don't, I don't want to deny that, but I do think, like I say, you don't need a village. You don't need five families in a neighborhood. You really just need like one or two families that you can, that share this idea with you, right? And and so we actually, it's been really great. Suzanne Gaskins told me about this. She calls it the auntie network where like, basically she teamed up. She So she lives part-time in this Maya village as an anthropologist, but she also graced her three boys in Chicago. And she teamed up with like two other families and they kind of shared the childcare and child rearing together. And so, you know, one family would pick up from school one day and another family would pick up school from the other day. And then the weekends they would, you know, drop the kids off at the house, other people's houses. And, and so you kind of create this, um, this little, little mini pod, right? Is what we would call it now after COVID where, you know, those are the allo parents, right? These families become the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, right? And, and so that's really all you need. I mean, even just, I've learned like one other family, one neighbor where the kid can just go over there and the other kid can come over, right? And, and so I think focusing more on like qu quality of these, these families and, and how they overlap kind of with, with your thinking of how kids should be treated mm -hmm. um, is more important than, than, quali than quantity, right? And um, mm -hmm. it can make a big difference and also just give you more breaks and, you know, I, I think we also shouldn't underestimate the support, right? That the parent feels like one of the things that is a massive contributor to our happiness and our state of feeling good about life is knowing you have somebody to 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 reach out to if something goes wrong, you know, and ha having that feeling. And I think it's like a really underestimated um, factor in our lives. And so these parents kind of form that too, right? That like once we have this, had this network, it's like, Oh, I know if like I need extra childcare or an emergency happens, there are these parents that we've grown close to and we can, you know, reach, reach, reach out to. So you're absolutely right. It is really hard. And I, when I got back and read the book, I actually lost and kind of disconnected with some friends because we didn't share the same, you know, views and perspective of children. And it's difficult. It's difficult to be around parents that are really bossing children around, which is the kind of the norm, you know, I, I really like emphasize in the book and I, and I want the listeners to know that like, we're talking about parents that like issue two commands an hour, right? Like two instructions mm -hmm. to the child. And I like 
measured like how many commands I was giving Rosie and it was like over a hundred an hour. Um, and so really shifting that had like a massive effect on me and Rosie in our relationship. And that like two, three commands an hour is really what autonomy is, right? Where you're, yeah. you're, and you're not, and you're not ignoring the child. You're, you're watching the child, and you're helping if needed, and you're guiding if needed. But it's, it's like one of the anthropologists told me. It's like the parent is actively resisting saying things, right? And, mm -hmm. and, I, this is what I mean. Western psychology is so aligned with these parents because that's what psychologists show over and over again. That's what children need is to just have the parents step back and let the child be right. You know, it's interesting. I took this little boy swimming and his dad told me, this was like two days ago. His dad told me like, you have to stand right next to him because he tends to go into the deep end. You know, you just stand right next to him. Okay. Stand right next to him. And I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then like, I got there and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to stand right next to him. And I'm going to watch him really carefully from like 20 feet away and see what happens, right? Is he veering into the deep end? And that child not once veered into the deep end. Every time he got near it, he went to the wall. And I'm telling you, if I stood next to him, it would be a different story, right? And, and, and that's, and I and his dad asked, did he, and I was like, oh, you know, I didn't stand next to him. And he was, he was fantastic. And that's the difference, right? Is like, okay, the, I'm gonna watch and see what the child can do mm -hmm. before I, I, you know, act you know, before mm -hmm. I intervene. And when parents intervene constantly and constantly like tell the child what to do, first of all, the child feels like they have no control over themselves, which creates enormous amounts of anxiety. But second of all, they never have a chance to try. You know, mm -hmm. the little boy would never have a chance to try to take care of himself and keep himself out of the deep end if the parent is always there, you know, like hovering, so. Yeah, and you know, you, when you talk about kind of emotion management and and how kind of anxiety is is contagious, uh, you know, I thought a lot of what you were saying extended beyond the parent sure. child relationship. I mean, it, it's it it's something that affects you as a, as a member of any organization, any couple, right? I mean, you know, a lot of what you were saying resonated with me with respect to you know how companies are trying to encourage better teamwork, mm. right? So, you know, there are stories about companies and, and you know I, I know some folks at, at Facebook right when there would be like a, a system crash you know everybody would just be like all right let's let's you know figure out what the problem is and you know identify it and fix it and just like when you describe the coffee cup flying <laughs> across the the the, the carpet yes. you know people were just like okay right. you know I mean I remember one time so you know uh, uh, some, someone like hit me with their car and, and I, and I got out and I was like, Oh, okay. Hey, what's up? And, and they I think they were expecting me to be raging at right, them, but right. it's like, Hey, you know, it, it, it's water under <laughs> the bridge. Right. So, so that seems like a, a, a general, a, a general skill that, that, you know, needs to be, needs to be mastered. And it's a good thing about it is that it's contagious. Yeah, right? for sure. Right. Like, like if you're gonna, what's the point of yelling, right? That the, the anger has no purpose. This is this is the thinking, right? That anger actually gets in the way of of being productive. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the the narrative though in our society though is that anger is very productive, right? And mm -hmm. um, it. And if you well, if you reward it, if people you know get what right. they want, it for, enables you know having a tantrum right. or whatever. Right. Yeah, and this whole thing of like you're so angry and like do you want something? I mean that's that's in many ways, teaching people that, you know, anger is okay, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're ignored every time you get angry, if, if the parent literally turns their back and walks away, or then it could be different, right? And and, and also, mm -hmm. if, if you're reminded that anger has, has, has no purpose, right? Or, or is devalued, right? So there's a psychologist that a cross-cultural psychologist who's looked at like societies where anger is devalued. And she's found that, you know, people are less likely to call on an emotion that a society thinks is unproductive, mm -hmm. right? Because why would you call on it if it doesn't help? But in a society that yeah. thinks an emotion is productive, your, your brain is more likely to call on it, right? So, um, yeah. but I mean, the parents have a lot of well, control over this aspect of before kids go to school and stuff, right? Of really teaching that that lesson. You know, I think Ruth Ginsburg's mom would say that 
Like it's, it never helps to be angry or like it, it's not, it's unproductive. And she was like notorious for like, you know, not getting angry. And I, there's some really good quotes from her about it. And it come, it came from her mom, you know, not society. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I mean, a lot of it just comes from the external environment. I mean, people are, are anxious about, you know, their work and they're anxious about their health and they're anxious about their finances. And then, you know, the easiest thing in the world to do is just make the problem go away in the short run, even if it means a recurrence of the problem yeah. later. Yeah. So, um, well, the last part of your book, I mean, you, you actually describe a single problem that you resolved, right? Which is, you know, getting Rosie to go to bed. <laughs> and it, it illustrated, you know, every aspect of the kind of team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, acronym. So maybe you could just Yes. quickly tell us what do the TEAM stand yeah. for and and then tell us the story of getting her to bed and how it kind of illustrated this. Yeah, so the team I kind of made up so I can remember these things, um, especially in the moment of like, oh my God, what do I do? Uh, but but there are like four elements and you could think of five because you can add in the two A's that you can find like all around the world. I think they're very universal when it comes to parenting. I'm sure mm -hmm. you can find exceptions, but um, but generally... It's the way parents related, have related to children, likely for thousands of years. So T is for togetherness, that things are really done mm -hmm. together. This idea that young children especially go off and do things on their own, like make your bed, you know, um, go do your homework. Like all everything is done like by themselves and you're, we're like pushing that all the time. This is very strange. Instead, children are welcomed into the adult world and guided, like we talked about earlier, right? Given an opportunity to try, got, you know, guided, shoot away if they're very, very like intrusive and destructive, but generally welcomed. Um, and if you want a kid to do something and they're resisting, try doing it together. You know, let's clean up the room together. Um, let's go to my work and hang out. You can hang out with me. You know, kids want to be with their family. E is this idea that like is to encourage that, ev that the vast majority of people, including children, are much more likely to do something if they don't feel forced, but encouraged. Mm -hmm. And the Inuit especially have like all these tools to encourage proper behavior and teach proper behavior and get the child to kind of think and figure out what's right instead of like really forcing them to do what you say, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I do this all the time. If I feel like I have to do something, I never want to do it. But if I feel like it's up to me and mm -hmm. I'm kind of encour encouraged, I'll do it. So encourage, not force. And then A is for autonomy, which we've talked about a lot. It's, it's this idea that like, it's not completely independent. And a lot of psychologists, you know, talk about this different differentiating between autonomy and independence. It's, it's uh, you know, feeling like you have the choice to do what you want from moment to moment, but you have constant responsibility back to a group. So you're constantly like looking after other others and making sure they're okay. You're sharing, you're helping, you're being respectful. And so it's, 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 um, it's it's independence though, but wrapped in this kind of structure. Um, I think it's like the sweet spot. I think we like to be independent, but we also are really social creatures, and we, especially as children, we want to we want to be connected and we want to contribute. Like we, children want to contribute, and you could also say AA is allo parenting because that is very universal. Um, and then T is like. Oh, sorry, M is like minimizing interference. Yeah. So we tend to, like you said at the beginning, the more we do, the better, right? The more we interfere, the better. The more we take them to classes, the more, I mean, just, just this idea that more and more and more when it comes to parenting is better. And in fact, less could be much better. <laughs> like, you know, stepping back and, and watching, watching the little boy to see if he actually goes into the deep end. You know, inter interfering only when really needed. And, and when you start to watch your child, instead of talking to them all the time and doing, you know, shaping their behavior, shaping their path, you start to really learn about them, you know, what they're interested in, what they like to do. I watched this little boy for like two hours yesterday swim. And I now I know like everything about the way he swims and like what he likes to do. And like, well, after, after this podcast is published, I don't think your, his dad is going to let you, <laughs> let you take him to the pool anymore. But he was totally fine. I mean, I... <laughs> Totally. There were also like two lifeguards, like what literally one lifeguard is right above him. The whole thing. Like, that's the thing. That's the fear. Right. Is that I'm a bad parent. But one would argue and a lot of parents around the world would say I was a better parent. Right. Because because mm -hmm. he's learning that on his own. And, you know, a lot of times parents give the impression to the child that they're on their own. This happened a lot when we were traveling that I thought Rosie and I were on our own. 
and I thought the kids were on their own. But then, like, you pay attention and there's somebody behind you watching and making sure you're okay. Right. But it's that sense of like, I'm doing it by myself. Suzanne Gaskins has a beautiful description of it. So she says, if you look at American parents, European American parents, especially, you know, when a child is learning to walk, a toddler, they're in the front holding their hands and saying, come, come this way. And you see this with the swimming too. They're like showing the child how to swim. Right. And the Maya parent, she says, is behind the toddler and ready to like catch them or hold them up if they fall. But the child. Well, you know, the funniest, yeah. the funniest thing I've seen is I've, I've walked by playgrounds where I'll see four kids and four parents, and they're all the parents are playing with their kids. Yes, this is crazy, <laughs> and, right? And none of the kids are playing with each other. And I'm like, this is this is really really interesting. I mean, playing with children is very. Where strange. else in the world are you? Yeah, see yes, that? exactly. Where else? Maybe yeah. maybe parts of China. Maybe parts of China. Um, but yes, uh, this is very strange, right? And is it good parenting? I don't know. Oh, well, okay. So it sounds like uh, Rosie's definitely going to go to sleep without you having to. <laughs> so, so, so we know yeah, that. So I and, finally, I couldn't get Rosie to go to sleep for like a hundred years. I couldn't get Rosie to go to sleep. It was like craziest time in our life. Like our, our day it was like, you know, nighttime and she'd run around and she'd take off her clothes and my husband would be screaming. I'd be screaming. And what I started to realize is one, using the formula, right? Like model practice and acknowledge. And I realized like, okay. I'm modeling screaming at that time, for sure. I'm modeling like high energy anger and she's practicing it, right? She's practicing getting mm -hmm. crazy at night, right? And I was like, well, this is awful. Like this is, this is why I didn't learn how to go to sleep until I was like 30, 40, because my mom treated me the same way. It was like arguing and yelling and mm -hmm. running around. And so I started to say, think, okay, I need to use this team method, right? And so, and I needed to use the two commands an hour. And I challenge the listeners to give your child two commands at night, at bedtime, in the morning before school. Um, and so that involved really like me not doing, saying anything, right? But mm -hmm. I would do it together. So when I felt like she was tired, I'd be very calm and I would go and get in her bed and just lay there. And the first couple of nights I just read on the phone for like ever, cause she wouldn't, she didn't come, but like eventually she got the idea and she would come in you know, and then I would encourage her. I'd be like, oh, you know, you seem kind of tired. I'm tired. Like, and I would be calm. Everything's about calmness, you know. So we encourage her, E, a little bit of encouragement. Maybe we should brush our teeth, you know. But then she chose it. So autonomy, right? She chose mm -hmm. to come upstairs and get in the bed. She chose this, right? Um, and then I would interfere and help, but minimally, as little as possible, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the first couple of nights she went to bed really, really, really late. I mean, but she got up in the morning, which is crazy. Like that was the big fear that she wouldn't get up in the morning, you know? But um, I don't know, it wasn't very long, but after like a week, she started doing it by herself. And, you know, it just became like, like I say in the book, like not hard at all. Like, I was just like, you know, and I think what the problem was is like, I think our method, children aren't learning to sense their bodies and sense like, okay, what it feels like to be mm -hmm. a, to be tired and say, okay, now I need to go to bed because it's so structured and so based on what the parent thinks is the right time. And so I, I think what we were teaching her over that like week or two weeks was like to really sense that like, oh, my body feels tired now and this is what we do when I feel tired. And mm -hmm. and I remind her that like, if she gets upset in running around at night, I'll say, you know, I think, you're, I think your body's tired and like your mind's tired. And, you know, so it's like you encourage and, um, but it's just it's something you have to learn. Exactly. It's something that you have to learn. Uh, and yeah. I wasn't taught it until I was an adult because I went, I was very scheduled. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, one of the historians t t told me that he, he really thinks it's one of the reasons why we have so much problems sleeping is because there's all this anxiety and stress and fighting and around that time that gets trained, mm -hmm. right. From a young, from a young age. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, it was a very big, a very big change in our lives. Yeah, and it helped you to sleep better too. Oh, for sure. sure. I mean, now she's six and she's great. I mean, she goes to bed at kind of random mm -hmm. times, but you know, it doesn't bother me. She gets up. <laughs> well, there's one metaphor. There's one metaphor used in the book which says, you know, if you want to create a good wine that'll age well, you need to have you need to be a good winemaker for one, but you really have to have a good soil as well. And so I think 
you know, you're describing the winemaking process, and you also kind of mentioned it's important to create that environment, right, for your your child to kind of mature and yeah. age well. And that I think that comes from your um, your your training in the wine <laughs> business, which I guess you know that that'll be that'll be another book that you can uh, put out sometime. I later, tried right? to sell a wine book a long time ago, and I couldn't sell it, but um, now it might be a different story. So, <laughs> right. Well, Michaeline, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a great oh. conversation. Uh, your book, Hunt, Gather, Parent. I think it's uh, it's going to oh. be a classic. Um, hopefully, you know everybody will read it, um, and uh, maybe even they'll have these new holidays. You mean you could start a tour business where you could um, start having parents take their kids down to these places and and get a little dose of you know parenting instruction and create a little bit of extra you know income for these these households i, I could i could see a lot of people signing it's up for interesting this. though you know i don't know if they would want us <laughs> <laughs> you know at the beginning when we were in the arctic those women were like okay this this person has no clue how to parent and you know but it's a good idea i mean i do i do hope that um and i have to say the paperback version just came out so you guys um but i do hope that the book spurs you know journalists and scientists to really value and and listen to a lot of different voices right like get over that idea that you brought up at the beginning of like what can we learn because there's there is just yeah. there's just so much to learn and and every kid is so different right and we have this very kind of restricted view of what's right as a parent and just opening that view up i think would help a lot of people you know and just okay well this doesn't work for my kid but maybe this would you know um mm -hmm. And, and I, I hope that happens. I hope that the, there's an Inuit parenting book out soon. That would be amazing. And I hope we have an academic department. Yes. Maybe we need an academic soon. department. Maybe eventually that's what, you know. I mean, I do think there's room for treating parenting in the right way. You know, instead of treating it as this, like, hard mm -hmm. science. I, I think I think... I think that that could really improve improve things. I don't think it's doing the field justice by... by we're calling it a science because it's just so complex, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> so complex. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, okay. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.